as I said, he needed to go through Samaria because there was someone there that desperately needed something that only he could give. Well, before we dive in, it would be helpful to understand a bit of backstory on the time and the culture. A woman's fate at this time was totally tied to the men in her life. To when she was young, her father, to when she became an adult, to her husband. And if they were good men, she did well. If they were bums, she suffered. Also at this time, the popular view of divorce was very liberal and allowed a man to divorce his wife for any reason. In fact, you may remember that in the Gospels, the religious leaders come to Jesus to ask him to weigh in on the debate about divorce. Because the popular view had become uh, that, that a man could divorce his wife for any perceived uncleanness that he found in her. And there was one liberal rabbi who had interpreted that to mean anything she did that displeased her husband, like burn the toast, he could divorce her for burning the toast. And in a culture where a woman's fate is tied to her husband, when he divorces her, she becomes damaged goods and she goes out penniless. Hey, listen, there was no court that she went to with some judge that equally divided the holdings. No, he kept everything. And she was on her own. And because she's been married, now she's considered damaged goods. Today we meet a woman who was regarded as just that, damaged goods, several times over. So much so that she has become a pariah in her village. All the other women in town shunned her. And it was only the dregs of the men that regarded her. Look at verse 5. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. It's noon. It's the middle of the day. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Rule number one of being a disciple, you never leave the rabbi. You're always there. Why? Because the goal of a disciple is to be? And so if your goal is to be just like the rabbi, you are always with him. You never leave his side because you want to know what he's going to do or say in any and every situation. You never leave him. Rule number two of being a disciple, do what the rabbi says, or you're not going to be a disciple very long. So, if these guys have gone to town to get food, it's because Jesus sent them. What's odd is that he didn't send just two or three of them into town to get some food, which they could have easily done, They could have looked out the local subway and, you know, grabbed some footlongs and brought them back. He sends all of them. And the reason why is because he has an appointment with someone that won't talk to him if anybody else is around. Sure enough, here she comes. What's odd is that she comes to draw water at noontime. Now, water is heavy. And the pot that she is going to get water in is ceramic. It's been glazed. It's been fired in glaze so that it will hold the water. The pot itself, empty, is heavy. You put water in it, a couple of gallons, that's very heavy. And in a moment, we'll read that this is a deep well. When she came to the well, what she would find there is a rope with a bucket on the end of it, typically made of wood that has been lined with something like leather that will help keep the water in it. You would lower it down, and you would draw it up. Now, it is a woman's job to draw water. In this culture, women draw water, men do not. And so you you, you come uh, to draw the water, you you lower the bucket down. How many of you have ever carried water? Raise your hands, honestly, raise your hands. Okay, light or heavy? It's heavy, water's heavy. So imagine the shoulders on these ladies, right? pulling up that water. She pours it into her pot, lowers it back down, probably does a couple of buckets, maybe three, four buckets before she fills up her water pot. It's heavy. 
As a result, you don't come to draw water in the middle of the day when it's the hot time. When do you come? Come in the morning. You come early. And you hope that the water you draw is enough to last through the whole day. If not, you've got to come back. You will come in uh, the beginning of the evening when the sun is moving towards the horizon and the cool breezes off the Mediterranean are starting to come inland. You don't go in the heat of the day. So, now, imagine this. The women, it's their job to draw the water. They all come when? In the morning. First thing, it's the first thing they do. They get up, they uh, put their scarf on, and they, they come with their pot. They come out to the well, all of them. And here's this gathering of women every morning at the well. See, during the daytime, their lives are consumed with domestic chores. They don't really get a chance to see each other. When's the one time they all get to be together? In the morning, drawing water. And here they are. So I want you to lay, tell me now. What, do you, what happens when a bunch of women get together? What do they do? Okay, I, okay. see, this is good. This is good. They talk. Yeah, I saw, saw a couple of you doing this. Yeah, they talk. Now, what's interesting is when I asked that question this service, I heard about an equal distribution of men and women. First, sec, first service and second service, when I asked that question, only the ladies said they talk. The men didn't. But you guys did. It's not because you're more awake than they were. It's because the men first and second service are a little bit smarter. <laughs> They're like, I'm not answering that question. Just kidding. Just kidding. I was a little surprised. First service I asked, it was all women that went. They talk. And I was like, how come none of the guys answered that? <laughs> So, so here's all the women, here they are, and they're, they're chit-chatting, they're talking. It's their time to, to talk, to catch up on the latest news, and a good part of what they talk about at this well is this woman. Because she's the subject of a lot of talk. And that's why she's not there. She doesn't come out in the morning. She doesn't want to encounter these women because she's a pariah. She's the subject of their news sharing. No, she comes out in the middle of the day when she's hoping to see no one. She doesn't expect anybody to be there. But this day, there's a stranger there. And he does the unthinkable. He speaks to her. More than that, he asks for a drink. And she's stunned because it's obvious by his manner and his dress, he's a Jew. And here's the thing. Jews hate Samaritans who are more than happy to return the favor. There's a long history there we don't have time to go into. We will on Wednesday evening. Suffice it to say, Jews and Samaritans do everything they can to avoid each other. Which makes verse 4 our first hint that something unusual is going on. Remember what verse 4 said? He needed to go through Samaria. No, he didn't if all you're doing is looking at a map. Galilee is a Jewish region that's in the north. Judea, with the capital of Jerusalem, is a Jewish region in the south, and sandwiched between them is Samaria, which is populated by, you guys are good, Samaritans. See how that works? You would think that if you want to travel from Galilee to Judea, you would travel along the mountain ridge the shortest route. No, they would go from Galilee in the north over to the Jordan River, which is downhill a long way, travel along the Jordan River, and they have to hike back uphill about 2,000 feet to get to Jerusalem. And it's a much longer route. It, it would be like if you lived in Ventura and you wanted to go to the Camarillo Outlet Mall, uh, you said, I, I don't want to go through the Nard. So you drove out to Fillmore and took the back road to Moore Park and then came in through Camarillo. It, it's quite frankly, it's the same thing. This is what they do. They didn't travel through Samaria because it was considered enemy territory and they didn't want to have anything to do with these people. Jesus defied convention, and he takes the shortcut right through enemy territory because there was a desperate and lonely woman who needed what only he could give. 
Verse 9, then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Now, certainly Jesus was thirsty and he wanted a drink. I mean, it says that earlier that he was weary, and so he waited there by the well. But he asks this question of her to jumpstart a conversation, which it does. He's broken all convention by speaking to her, by even being in her area. And she says, what's going on? Why are you here? In characteristic fashion, Jesus cuts through the chit-chat and gets right to the heart of her matter. What kind of person is he, she asks. He's the kind that has living water, and he will give it to her if she wants some. Now, here's what she heard when he said living water. See, (laughs) we're Christians. We read this, and we go, I know what living water is. He's talking about the gospel. He's talking about salvation, and he is indeed. But that's not what she heard Remember, as we read these stories, we need to ask, what did it mean to the original audience? You know what she heard when she heard living water? See, they had two kinds of water, still water and living water. Living water was running water. Still water was found in ponds, lakes, wells. Living water, running water, was found in streams, springs, rivers. Which is better water? Which is purer? Still water? or living water? Living water. Anybody that goes hiking knows you don't take drinking water from a pond. <laughs> you take it from a spring. You, take it, you want it running. It needs to be running water. That's what she understood him to mean by living water. And, and she looks around, she, well, there's no water here except this well, the still water. There's no stream running by, and buddy, you've got no bucket. So she's, she's wondering, what, what, what are you talking about? In chapter 3, Nicodemus was confused by Jesus talking about being born again. And he, he didn't get it. And he played rather dense. She's confused by his mention of living water. But she senses that he must be talking about something else. And so we read in verse 12, she asked this question, Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself? as well as his sons and his livestock? If Jesus is offering her something better than what's in that well, it it means he's implying he's better than the patriarch Jacob, the father of the tribes of Israel, you see? And and so she's questioning like, wait a minute, what are you saying? Are you claiming to be better than Jacob? That's a pretty big claim. Verse 13, Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water, and and, and know that he's pointing at the well. Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Now, Jesus makes clear he's not talking about literal H2O. Physical water satisfies the body's thirst, but not the soul's. Jesus gives lasting satisfaction to all that we are. He's now spoken the words that she needed to hear. The message that he took a detour through enemy territory to deliver has been given. And it explodes in her like a bomb that splits her wide open. Verse 15, the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. And friends, Jesus wants to give her what she needs, but there's something standing in the way. There's a big question, a big mystery that's still hanging out there. What's the mystery? Why is she here now? She's not been honest with Jesus. There's something going on in her life that has separated her from her peers and is brought her to this well in the middle of the day, and it's yet undealt with. If she won't come out with it, Jesus will press into it. 
Verse 16, Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. I, I, I really want to see the video. How many of you want to see videos when we get to heaven of these stories? Don't you want to see that you just, oh, Lord, show me the woman at the well. Show me. I, I, he, call, go call your husband. I want to know how long she stood there before she speaks. Because look at her words. The woman answered and said, um, I, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband, for you've had five husbands, and the one that you're now with is not your husband. In that, you spoke truly. She is a serial divorcee. And for whatever reason, she's burned through five marriages, and now she's shacking up. Now, we have no idea what her backstory is. Why she's had five husbands who've all dumped her, we have no idea. Whatever it was, she is a social outcast. So much so that it was too painful to be around the other women of Sychar. Friendless in a society that is all about community, she has hitched up with whatever guy is willing to let her stay there. Remember, a woman's fate is tied to the men. We, we, have, we have no idea what this guy was like, but the insinuation is, listen, if you've burned through five guys already and now you're with a guy that won't marry you, how do you suppose she's being treated in this relationship? But what else is she going to do? Because if she doesn't have somebody at least providing her a place to stay, she's on the street. Do you begin to feel for this woman? When Jesus makes clear he knows all about her situation, she fears that maybe he knows more. And so she tries to divert the attention away from her inner life and her turmoil and her distress and brokenness to safer ground. <laughs> Notice verse 19. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. <laughs> Brilliant deduction. Our father is worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. While Jews and Samaritans shared a lot of the same religious beliefs, they also differed in some notable areas, and one of the most important was where to worship God. The Jews, of course, said that you worship God in the Jerusalem temple. The Samaritans, because they have nothing to do with the Jews, had to come up with an alternative place to worship, and so they had built a temple on a mountain called Gerizim, which is right above the city of Samaria, their capital. And they said, we, no, you worship God here. The Jews said, no, you worship, you worship here. Do, do you see what she's, look at what she's doing. Jesus is pressing into something very personal, very deep. This is the thing she agonizes over. And when Jesus starts to go in that ground, what does she do? She backs up, whoa, 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 whoa. And she broaches a theological question. This is what people do when they start falling under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. You've probably experienced it. People start to sense their brokenness, their need. That's uncomfortable. It can be deeply painful. As we realize God is pressing into those areas of our life that are the kinds of things that we tried to wall off, that we tried to put in the closet, that we tried to lock the door to. And God says, I want to deal with that stuff. I, I want to go in there and I want to forgive you and I want to root that stuff out and I want to make you new. And a lot of people look at that and say, I don't want to go there. I'm okay. And so what they'll do is they'll push back by taking a step back and they'll start raising challenges and objections. God isn't real. God isn't good. The Bible's just a book of myths and legends. It's full of contradictions. Then they'll start asking questions and challenges that they've heard and they think argue against the biblical God. They'll say something like, oh yeah, well, if God is real, can he make a, a rock so big he can't lift it? I love it when I get asked that question. I love it. If God played baseball and pitched to himself, would he strike out or hit a home run? Now, some of you are going to trip out on that. And you're not going to hear anything I say for the rest of the day because you're going to be working on that one. Just put it this way, God doesn't play baseball. 
Hey, there are legitimate questions that people have. Some people, they, they think, they, they, they come, maybe they've heard something someone else say, and they go, yeah, what about that? That doesn't kind of jive. All because their ideas about God aren't biblical. And so they see these contradictions or these problems, and they really struggle, and all they need is for somebody to give them an answer, and it's like, oh, okay, well, that's resolved and they can come to faith. This is, this is what happened to many of you. You had issues, somebody answered them, you go, okay, and you're here today because that got answered. That's what Peter says. Be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks you a reason for the hope that's within you, and do it meekly and with fear. But many other people only use those challenges and those objections as a fence to hide their unbelief behind. And you can tell the difference between, because when they'll raise one of those objections, and when you answer it, instead of responding and going, oh, that's a great answer, what do they do? They just bring up something else. It doesn't matter what you say, they don't move any closer towards faith because they're not interested. They're just hiding their unbelief behind these objections, theological, philosophical when Jesus steps into her brokenness, she refuses to go with him. She tries to dodge. Oh, yeah, where should we worship? Jerusalem or Gerizim? Well, Jesus uses her question to bring the subject and the conversation back around to him and her. And, and, and that's a really good way for you to deal with the objections that you hear. Bring them back around to Jesus and the person that you're talking to. Look at what he says. Verse 21, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You, that is Samaritans, worship what you do not know. We, Jews, know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. That was clear in Scripture. God said that he would you know, bring blessing to all the earth through Abraham's descendants. Verse 23, But the hour is coming and now is. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Watch this. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. Now do you understand why Jesus needed to go through Samaria? Because the Father is seeking true worshipers. And he's willing to go to Samaria. He's willing to go to Oxnard. Verse 24, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, we're going to dive deeper into that in our study on Wednesday. For now, look at how he bends her safe question about the place of worship to the heart of worship. She's asked about where. He said, listen, that's not important. What's, what's important is how and when, and the time has come. The time is now. Because God's not waiting on some mountain in Jerusalem or in Samaria. God is standing at a well in Sychar. And it's time for her to worship him. She gets a hint. Verse 25, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. He was called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. And it's at this point the disciples return with lunch. They're amazed their rabbi is talking to some random woman because that's all she is to him, to them. The fact is she is the reason they are in Samaria and not over by the Jordan River. But as they arrive, she leaves because she has moved out of her hesitancy to believe into full-on faith in him. Verse 28, the woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, to the who? Why didn't she go to the women? <clears throat> what, what, what would all the women have done if she had gone in and said, I found the Messiah? Oh, another one of your boyfriends, huh? No, that's exactly what they would have said. They're so prejudiced against this woman, they can't hear what she says, even when she brings them truth. So she goes to the men. Come, see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? 
she leaves her water pot behind. Did you see that, how John mentions that? She leaves her water pot. Why? Because that sucker's heavy. And she wants to get back to town as fast as she can because she has good news. Not only that, <laughs> but Jesus' promise of living water has been fulfilled. She's satisfied now. Oh, she's going to go back and get her water pot, but she's got good news. And he's poured himself into her, and she is so excited. She can't wait to tell others. Hey, come, come meet somebody that told me everything I ever did. And she's not hiding in shame. This guy's told me everything I ever did. And the men are like, wait, what? And you're excited about it? You? You can imagine the nicknames they had for this lady. He told you everything you ever did, and you're willing to broadcast that? We know everything you ever did. And it's caused you to walk around this village with your head down and your scarf over so you didn't have to meet anybody's eyes. But your scarf is back now, and you're looking at us in our eyes, and you're telling us, come meet somebody who's changed my life. Jesus had an appointment with a Samaritan woman. Jesus has an appointment with you. And just as with her, he will go out of his way to keep it. And just as Jesus knew her, he knows you. He knows your stuff. He knows the things that terrify you. He knows what's in that closet in your soul that you've locked up. He knows the things that you hope desperately are never made public. He knows it all. He knows your brokenhearted past. He knows it all, and he loves you. And he stands before you here today and he says, let me give you living water. You have spent your life going to the wells of this world looking for satisfaction. And yes, they slake your thirst for a time, but you always end up back at some well. Let me satisfy your soul. In just a moment, we're going to have a time of worship and we're going to invite people to come and partake of communion. And if you're here today and you've never received Christ, behold the Jesus of the Bible. Put aside your preconceived ideas of who and what he is and behold the man in this story who was willing to defy convention and all the expectations of all his people, the Jews, to go reach out to a woman no one else, even her own people, had any time for. And he changed her life forever. And she went back to her village, and because of her testimony, a bunch of other people got saved too. Because all the people of this village came out to meet Jesus. And they said, now that we've encountered him, we see what you mean. So as we worship this morning, we're going to, come to the Lord's table. And if you want to receive Christ today, we're going to ask you, just join us. Come take a piece of bread, which represents his body that was broken for you. A cup represents his blood shed for you so that you can be forgiven for your sins. Jesus said, if you will confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father in heaven. If you won't, I won't. We need to receive Christ publicly. We, we give people many different ways to do that, raising their hand, you know, or standing or praying a prayer with someone. Today, if you want to receive Christ, you come and partake of communion with us. Christian, let's learn from the example of our rabbi here. He was willing to endure misunderstanding by his peers, by his own disciples by going through Samaria, by talking to a outcast. 
in Christ, there is no black or white. There's no red or yellow. There are no borders. There are no ethnic groups. There is just people that God loves and wants to save. There is no room in the body of Christ for anything that would set us at odds with one another. Amen? There is no room in the gospel for prejudice and bigotry. There is no room. We are all one in Christ. And we must be willing to go wherever he calls us. Wherever he calls us.